swimming or sailing or sitting and sunning, if you dream of lazy days and lazy ways of having fun, if you long for the romance and charm of old Italy, go to Wales. That's it, go to Wales, to North Wales to be exact, to Marianasshire, where Port Marion nestles beside Tramadic Bay as though it were the Mediterranean. And everything he did, somebody would always say, now you've ruined it. <laughs> Every single thing he did. Luckily, he it took no them. notice. <laughs> a man's dream transformed the coastline that is now Port Marion. Slowly, it became a piece of Italy. Slowly, the dream became fabulous reality. That man is Welsh architect Clough Williams Ellis, who wanted his own Portofino. Little Italian harbour, which with its gay rococo architecture, backed by its hanging woodlands, is still, to me, one of the loveliest places on this earth. If I met Cluster, I'd say, look at the trouble you've got me in. I've, had, I've built this thing and I've gone mad with it and it's nearly ruined me. <laughs> Having scoured the coasts of Britain from the West Highlands to the Scillies, at last found what seemed to me perfection. But perfection here combines with practicality. Here is an hotel and a town hall and garages and shops. No great work of mine stands out against the sky in splendor to excite men's wonder. Well, how can he say that? This place really takes everybody, it's not just their wonder, their total pleasure in architecture. He said, I will only be known as a polemicist. I won't be known for anything that I've built. But I think, better than even reading that terrific book, The Pleasures of Architecture, this is his greatest polemicist act, the building of Port Marion itself. As a child, I just lamented that my lot was cast in Victorian non-conformist Wales, instead of in some such sparkling setting as decadent 18th century Venice, where I would, of course, have had my father a dilettante prince with a baroque palace, a state barge, gorgeous mistresses, negro pages with monkeys, painted ceilings, glittering chandeliers, banquets, masked balls, processions, fireworks, the lot. All my life, I've had consciously to fight down my innate and inordinate craving for gorgeous elaboration, regal splendor, and even mere opulent display, lest vulgar profusion should overwhelm my basic sense of fitness and propriety. Uh, from the age of about five, I was utterly resolved that I was going to be an architect. And above all, what I wanted to do was to build a village of my own, or even a township. He never fitted as far as architecture was concerned. Um, he started um, to work as an architect by going to the Architectural Association, um, one of the best schools of architecture in Great Britain. How does Cough find out about it? He looks in the telephone directory under architecture and sees the Architectural Association. So he calls, sends up his card and joins terrific school of architecture. He only spends three months there. Why does he only spend three months there? Because somebody has given him a job and he takes his builder into lectures. So they say, I'm afraid this is really disturbing the other students and either you have to stop doing this or leave. So Clough, he wants to build, he leaves. Well, I've done some engineering, you see, and I've uh, done science at school in Cambridge and I could read a slide rule, and I had some common sense. <laughs> and, and that's all you needed. And nothing did for that. To begin with, I thought that uh, my dream could only be realized uh, if I was monarch of all size surveyed and that nobody else could interfere with it, and that my dream couldn't be edged with nightmare jelly building. But uh, my uncle, 
there was Osmond Williams up at the council here. And suddenly, he said, look, I wonder if you could find me an acceptable tenant or even a purchaser for Abbey Yard. He never lived here. He wasn't interested in it. And I said, well, I haven't seen it because, as you know, nobody's been allowed in because of your fierce old lady who occupied it. They wouldn't even allow her nearest neighbours in. But once I'd penetrated within the protecting wall and seen what was there, I felt, well, my goodness, I need look no further. This is it. This was perfection for what I wanted to do, so I resolved that here was my chance. I knew that whatever I had, whatever I might construct, had to have an economic basis of some sort, otherwise I couldn't do it, couldn't afford it. And uh, the obvious thing, given that wonderful site and that wonderful area generally, was tourism. And so the first thing was to turn the old house, what was of it, into a, for the first beginning, a very ramshackle sort of hotel and then to add round that uh, a village. 42 years ago, I discovered this place of wilderness, just the old deserted mansion and stables and one cottage. And now, all this, which has given pleasure to countless people, much more to myself. Indeed, it has been my love affair with life. He didn't care much about people at all, well, whatever he nationality. Really he well, didn't he liked care. people to enjoy the environment. Yes, he liked people in that but he way. Wasn't, um, but he didn't like people level, as people much. No, he wasn't particularly interested in people. He wasn't at all interested. He liked in people. people who wanted houses built. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and the richer the better, because he could build a more yes. interesting house. He could have more clients and things. He was much, really more interested in buildings than much. people. Much. He wasn't really interested in people at all. Remember, Port Merion is a very small place and access must be limited. It can so easily be overcrowded and therefore spoiled. The only practical way of limiting access is by the toll. It's a blunt and rather brutal instrument, but there's no other that I can think of. So when we are threatened by overwhelming crowds, up goes the toll, and so down goes the pressure. So I remember yeah. the opening very well. We drove down from London. My father had a most enormously long grey car, what sort, I don't know. But it was so long that it had a second windscreen for the back passengers, which of course was us. So it was hours and hours and hours driving on this mm. very uncomfortable car. And uh, we drove up, and I, I believe this house was uh, built, some people say it was built then, but I don't believe he really built anything before the hotel opened, because I don't see where the money would have come yes. from. And, um, but anyway, I wasn't conscious of it, and we went down to the hotel, and um, there was... Uh, Miss Riemann, who is a very well, austere, lady, austere, wasn't she? austere is a very polite way of putting it. It was Easter when it opened, and or rather for Easter, we were let into the entrance hall, and there was the office on one side, and it was cut off from the uh, people entering by a glass screen, and on it were shelves, and she'd filled the shelves with what she called Easter novelties. Where I remember them as about that size, black chocolate rabbits about that which must have cost several pounds each and she thought the guests would buy them but I don't think anybody ever did. <laughs> Actually we started off there with a large party which we thought might breed of uh, various people, writers and uh, actresses and so forth. It was first invaded largely by the stage which wasn't surprising because it was a sort of stage set really and then uh, by dramatists who followed them, and then uh, writers of all kinds. I think the first one of any prestige was Bernard Shaw. Uh, we had to refuse him the first time, which was very shocking, because we, we hadn't room. Then he came again and advised me not, I remember. <laughs> he said, don't ask Arnold Bennett, because 
He's very particular about his food. And yours, uh, as yet, is not nearly good enough. I suppose I wanted to partly uh, to paint a propagandist picture, I might say. I wanted to show that you could develop a place, even a very beautiful place, without defiling it. In fact, if you did it with sufficient loving care and, and expertise, you might even add to what God had given you as your background. I know somebody, who it was, but some knowledgeable friend said to, to my father, who it was, an architect probably, when they saw that little watch house going up, that was the first building that I'm conscious of anyway, he said, now you've ruined the place. <laughs> <laughs> and everything he did, somebody would always say, now you've ruined it. <laughs> Every single thing he did. Luckily, he, he took no them. notice. <laughs> the beauty of the village of Port Merion in North Wales, an architect's dream come true. It's in a sheltered cove of Tremadic Bay, all the warmth of a Mediterranean setting has been brought to Wales. Materials collected in frequent round-the-world travels have gone to the building of houses and villas planned to the architect's original design. Some of the doorways are made of timbers from the gallant Arethusa, famous British warship. Port Merion really took some time to uh, get known, to, to even to appear on our ordnance maps. Partly, I think, because I changed its name. Its Welsh name was Abbey Yar, which means frozen mouth. I thought it was rather ugly name anyhow, and it didn't sound very hospitable. So I said, Port Marion, Port to put it on the sea, Marion to put it in Marionis. I thought it was compact. I wish I'd kept a diary, and now, looking back, it's very hard to say what went up in what order. But I know the first two buildings were the cottages at the brow of the hill before we go down to the hotel, the Angel and the Neptune. Then I think the Chantry, which is right up on top, um, and the Watch House on the edge of the cliff, where Noel Coward wrote that delightful thing of his, Blythe Spirit. As a matter of fact, I rather jumped the gun in the matter of the Campanile because that went up the second year. Um, I wanted to show that something was happening, and I thought a distinguished uh, <laughs> bit of architecture would mark it out, which it did. So that was one of the few buildings that was thoroughly detailed all the way through uh, as being architecture uh, with a big A, whereas the other buildings sort of uh, grew as I wanted them. Well, having had a Campanile, I felt it was essential to have a dome to go with it. There was no other excuse. I was conscious of acute dome deficiency at Port Mayor. There was the Campanile, there were these buildings on the cliff edge, and I was perfectly certain that it wanted a bubble dome showing uh, between them. And so I made a dome it's there and fits in a miracle. The first time I went to Port Marion was uh, when we were filming for The Tube and we were doing sort of a spoof on Prisoner and that worked very well but once I got there I realised that 
that you know that was just a little tiny unimportant side issue really the prisoner i mean it bought except well it wasn't because it brought people to it and, and drew their attention to it but the main thing was the place itself Oh, what is this place? Where am I? Oh, here's the village hall. Hooray! I've got a very important hotel. I was very taken with the architecture. I'd always looked at architecture, and in many ways, I'd it kind of reawakened my sort of interest in it all, because um, I think that the way Clough Williams Ellis had designed things, I could see it was the same way. It was the same mind uh, uh, set. That a musician ha would have rather than an architect in that you could take ideas and sort of mix them up and put them have one thing that was inspired by one thing and one th thing would be inspired by something else you know for instance if you listen to say a Beatles record you could hear where sometimes they want to sound like Little Richard and sometimes they kind of want to sound like um, uh, Bach or something and I think it's the same with Clough you could see how he's looked at all the great masters of architecture and thought, well, I'll just have a bit of fun. I'm going to put this and have... An, I'm going to think in an Inigo Jones way today or today I'm going to think in a Dutch way or today I'm going to think in a little sort of a English vernacular or a, uh, an Italian village. Whatever he did, I think that he, he would take designs or have ideas but then deliver them in such a charming way, in such an enchanting way that you, sort of you suddenly learn to like that bit of architecture. I've established what I call my home for foreign buildings. Uh, I've been constantly offered fragments of distinguished architecture. That uh, colonnade I'd known some 40 years ago, the building to which it was attached in Bristol, was bombed in the war, and Bristol City was not prepared to do anything about it, and I went and I thought, this is splendid, and I was very kindly given the thing by the then owner, and it was a frightful job moving it because it had been loaded on lorries, then brought up from Bristol to North Wales, then dumped on the parking place, sorted out by my master mason, put up, and there are, and there it is. Oh, and then I, uh, the um, relatively new building, the Unicorn, uh, it's very noble. At least I think it is. Uh, it looks like a sort of um, miniature Chatsworth. I started off by copying Clough, and the front of this building is uh, a copy of the Unicorn building. You can look at the two, and they are very similar. And after that, I thought, well, I'm just going to have some fun now. So I would take one or two of the details, like sort of bay windows or whatever that he would do, um, and then I sort of would just have my own sort of fun with it, I realised. And somebody who'd met him said to me when they had asked him and said, well, how should we get the, the dimensions of an arch exactly right and all this sort of thing? He said, what are the exact measurements we have to use? And he said, just, oh, use your eyes. Port Marion, you see, is a microcosm. It's a miniature of what you find in the world outside. And it's very, very important to maintain that illusion, that scaling down of size throughout. Otherwise, it would give the thing away. I can see why he, he left architecture school, because I think he would have found it rather constraining, I think, and rather boring. And it would be better to go and actually kind of practice it. You know, and, and I mean, I think it's the, the, the truth, which some people dare not even say, because we're all trying to encourage people to do well at school, is there's more in the act of doing something. If you've got it in you, you just do it. You're better off just doing it. Also, I do rather like... You know, here in South East London, um, it can be in the winter, it can be quite gloomy. So having the bright colours cheers everybody up. And when we do a session here, that's a great thing. It works. That's a great thing. People like coming here because it's kind of, I suppose, different and uh, it's not grey and oppressive. I've run out of space here now, so I have to start somewhere else. But, yeah, on it goes. I don't, I'm not sure where, but somehow, well, yeah. Or, well, you know, you paint something a different colour or you find another ornament to stick on it or something, you know. If I met Cluster, I'd say, look at the trouble you've got me in. I've, had, I've built this thing and I've gone mad with it and it's nearly ruined me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
nonsense about beauty. All we want is something that will work. Of course we want things to work, and to work much better than they've ever worked before. But some of us have our pride, a, a certain fastidiousness, demanding that grace and good design be added to more, mere mechanical efficiency, or, or even to convenience. We need a comfort beyond that of the animals, which includes comfort to the eye and the spirit, loveliness, graciousness, and here and there, splendor. D. H. Lawrence, you remember, said somewhere, spiritually the English may be the salt of the earth, but as the builders of splendid cities, they are more ignominious than rabbits. Of course, I'm primarily a uh, domestic architect. I've never built large commercial buildings such as flats and shops and factories and so on, nor indeed wanted to, because that involves so many other people, engineers, consulting engineers, technicians of every kind, committee work and all the rest of it, which I'm not really fitted for. I'm quite sure I was a born architect. <laughs> Sounds arrogant again. Uh, I could have been nothing else. Uh, I'd have been a ghastly failure in any other walk of life, I think. But in this, I was supremely happy, supremely confident, and, uh, as it turns out, uh, very successful. Well, it seems to me that the Gloriette sums up so much about what Clough is trying to do here in Port Marion. It's got this curious quality of scale. Um, if you were to look at a photograph of it or see it from the distance, you wouldn't have any real idea of what size it is. It's only when you get close to it you realize that it's quite small. He calls it the Gloriette, and he uses that from Schönbrunn, a huge palace in Vienna, and then he names his tiny little building after it. Um, so it's got that curious thing about scale, this way that um, Disney in Disneyland actually builds things above eye level at three-quarter scale. Clough was doing it years before the Disney organization. Rightly or wrongly, I feel I've got an infallible judgment of what is fitting of scale and so on, I feel that I instantly know what the size should be, how it should be treated, where it should stand, and all the rest of it. It sounds arrogant, but uh, I'm an instinctive architect. Now, what Clough is so wonderful at doing is beckoning you from space to space to space. It just looks so deceptively easy when you're here in Port Marion and it's so difficult to do. But what he, he does is he, he frames openings. He doesn't let you gawp at the estuary. He lets you catch glimpses of it through an arch, through another arch. There's this sense of layering of space, that space is something that invites you in, invites you through, invites you to inhabit. Those are where he is so, so brilliant. And those people that perhaps hate this kind of... Um, scenographic, the scenery quality of Port Marion can't help but to be captivated by this essential quality of brilliant three-dimensional planning. Well, I think any view is always enhanced by a partially enclosing frame or foreground, just as a picture is. I, I've done it really all over the place because the number of buildings where they're fairly formal fenestration, the windows are arranged to a pattern, 
uh, fairly normally. And then I put a little window purely for that purpose. In fact, uh, some of them have got lenses in them so that you get a, a condensed view because it will let in a shaft of sunlight or you can look up at a particular skyline or anything else. People talk about picture windows now, these what you might call miniature picture windows, just little portholes. Just after he died, they found um, a report in his papers, as if he were a headmaster writing about himself. And he says, I am demonstratively and emphatically not an important architect. No great work of mine stands out against the sky in splendor to excite men's wonder. Well, how can he say that? This place really takes everybody, it's not just their wonder, their total pleasure in architecture. He said, I will only be known as a polemicist. I won't be known for anything that I've built. But he was a polemicist. I mean, he wrote very, very stridently. He wished to convert people to the glories of architecture. But I think, better than even reading that terrific book, The Pleasures of Architecture, this is his greatest polemicist act, the building of Port Marion itself. My favourite philosopher, Don Marquis, in his book, The Almost Perfect State, said, artists are the only persons who should be listened to about anything, about education, government, the conduct of life generally, forms of government, economic conditions, wars, upheavals and revolutions, inventions and sciences and philosophies, laws and leaders and evolutionary processes. All these things are of consequence only in their relation to the production of art and artists. The main thing is to get more Shakespeare's, another Leonardo, a second Beethoven. That is all that matters in this world. The purpose of the universe is play. The artists know that, and they know that play and art and creation are different names for the same thing, a thing that is sweats and agonies and ecstasies. The world exists for the purpose of producing artists, in order that artists may produce new worlds. And to give heed to anyone but the artists, but any subject whatsoever, is damn nonsense. <laughs> Fantastic. We open the dragon's eye in an hour here on 2W, but we're off to the Outer Hebrides next with a brand new episode of Coast. Coast.